Hello, and my name is Pete Rushmer, and I'm your host today of A Half Dozen Things podcast. A Half Dozen Things is a podcast for business owners just like you. Whether you're an underdog hungry for success, or you're already smashing it, but want to continue to level up, we are here each week for you to get insight and learning from the very best in the business. No fluff, no BS, and no self-proclaimed gurus talking about how easy business or life is. Hello and uh, welcome to this episode of uh, Half Dozen Things podcast. I'm joined today by John Henderson. Now, John and I have known each other probably for about four or five years now, um, from when I first started uh, the flagship business. And uh, John and I were in touch. We, I think, I think the first thing I'm, I can't remember exactly how we met, John, but I know you were involved with the HR um, Connect Over Coffee when we when when we yeah. did that some time ago. How did we yeah. meet, John? Do you, do you remember? Yeah, well, we did meet um, physically then when they had an event in Peterborough because that was a really good uh, forum, actually. It's quite useful for, uh, particularly if you're coming into HR, I think, where you, perhaps it's not your key area. So I think they sort of definitely put things out on the table and it's quite an open group, so that was quite good. Um, but also before that, I think you'd met Sarah through b and I, I believe. That was, that, the, that, that, was that the original be, connection. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Absolutely, yeah, through through B&I. And, yeah, um HR, HR Connect Over Coffee, to be fair, I haven't spoken about that group for some no. time. It was an absolutely fantastic group, mm, um, but it was a real shame. It was a real shame <laughs> COVID sort of put, put pay to that. And um, the, the community just sort of didn't carry on after that. But it was a it was an HR community that met up at the BGL offices in Peterborough uh, of an evening once a month. And uh, you got sort of HR and related CPD professionals uh, learning and development uh, involved and it was it was absolutely fantastic group anyway john i waffle on johnny mm. for the benefit of the listeners are you able to give yourself a bit of an introduction um let them know about you know wh- what you do at the moment and uh, cool. and and the business as well okay so i'm co-founder and director of uh, sarah Pemrose limited which i run uh, with my uh, wife the two of us so we specialize in optimizing performance through skill development um, so what that means effectively is we work very closely with companies uh, to identify where there are challenges in performance uh, and then we look at what skills are required and how we tackle that and then equip the teams with the skills uh, to uh, deliver the objective for the business. So we tend to focus on three areas, three main skills, uh, critical thinking, uh, lateral thinking and problem solving, uh, but they're very much applied to business uh, problems. So if we look at, for example, critical thinking, uh, it's really essential in the process of analysis. We live in a world of endless data, um, and there's lots of data flying around. I think something like 95% of the data generated we don't even use, and there's a lot of value in there. So actually, the process of breaking things down to understand it is a crucial part of critical thinking. Um, so ultimately, we're helping companies get more value out of the information they need and improve uh, improve performance. My background is uh, 25 years in uh, in logistics and supply chain, uh, and Sara uh, is a similar amount of time as an engineer, chartered chemical engineer. So a lot of our experience comes from shop floor. Um, I think originally, Pete, our original discussions were we were talking about specifications of Volvo trucks, I seem to remember. Uh, so uh, it's quite hands-on. Um, I think we've, we've experienced a lot of good work environments um, and perhaps some not so good. Um, and I guess we've seen the opportunity here where businesses can real, really benefit from improving performance. And I think that sort of shakes up the more traditional market of, of acquiring training for training's sake, which is, still has a, a key role, as, as, you, as you, you know yourself from, from what your customers ask you, but actually looking into what are business objectives of a company, what do they want to achieve, and really applying and embedding those uh, skills into a business. Because frighteningly, so much training is lost, the value of it's lost in the car park on the way back to your car. Um, And I think on that basis, it really is a case of trying to get the most value for the investment and really sort of change, um, change the culture and change some of the outputs from the business. Certainly that's, that's our objective. Um, So we're based in Northampton um, and we work quite a lot in manufacturing, uh, as you'd expect, and logistics businesses, a fair bit in professional services as well. Um, We've we've done some work recently um, helping out um, in a, a program on for innovators to help them with their pitches uh, in the sense of trying to help them get really explain what the commercial possibility of their idea is. You know, there's lots of ideas and 
you know, got the image of a crackpot scientist coming up with something in a, in a in a shed. But unless we can actually say what that idea is, the commercial value of that, then investors aren't going to be interested, uh, and the idea stays an idea. So how how could they really get the real value of what they're trying to invent out communicated in very simple terms, very simple language? What are the features? What are the benefits? And ultimately, the end result is that they're now getting much more interest from investors. Uh, and much more interest from people who want to take their product forward into into commercial production. So that gives a brief overview, I guess. Um, so yeah, hopefully that's uh, provided some uh, some information. That's absolutely fascinating. That's absolutely fascinating, John. And um, I, the, the the use of uh, of using that in in pit, pitches for sort of explaining technical uh, uh, technical things. That's mm. absolutely fantastic. Have you have you got sort of a, maybe an example or something like that of where where that's been used so that uh, to, to sort of help clarify how that would work yeah so if i give an example of, of, of a particular uh, innovator uh, we worked with um the basic i suppose if i explain the value in the output so typically trying to respond and we've all done it we've all looked at you know bank paperwork or any any sort of lot lot of paperwork there's lots of information required it's all quite confusing and if we can clarify in that uh, in the pitch or, or in a tender document, if we really understand what the requirements are, we can be very clear. So whoever's reading it can go, oh, these guys really understand what we're about, really get it. And it's about defining what do they mean? What 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 is the potential value here? So breaking that down. And what it means is that you can produce responses to either grant applications or tender documents a lot quicker, a lot smoother. So that means you get more tenders in. Uh, which are of higher quality. If you get more tenders in and more pitches in are of a higher quality, you end up with more opportunities. So it ends up with more revenue to the business. So it's just making that process simpler so that you really connect, you really understand what it is you're trying to communicate, really get across that value so people are clear in that. And I think that perhaps the example is if you take a page of text on something very technical, could be anything, could be you know, something to do with commercial vehicles, it could be something to do with, uh, you know, um, HVAC systems if you can explain that in three or four sentences that anyone can understand that's real value because then it makes it a lot clearer when you're trying to go networking or you're trying to just communicate the information to people and we all think it's obvious um, until you start reading for example insurance conditions and then you start thinking god I've got to lose the will to live here so it's that kind of idea of where's that where's that clarity and from that clarity you find the value and really people looking who are interested in your product want to see the value they don't doubt you, you're you good at what you do, and they might be very impressed with the technical aspect of it. But unless they can see where it's going to go, the commercial potential, then ultimately you, you've lost them because really innovation in a business is there to improve things. And if we can't get that value communicated, we're really going to lose that value. So that that's kind of... So the end result is that innovators now putting far more, uh, far, far better, more polished, simpler uh, tender documents and pitches into interested parties in a short space of time it's getting more funding getting more interest and ultimately the business is growing and succeeding as a result fantastic that's really really interesting really interesting so tell me a bit more about how so when when you deal with sort of businesses and they have challenges in performance what how does that normally present itself so if someone's listening and going oh well yeah we've got this challenge for example I don't know, they might have multiple stakeholders and one person believes this and one person believes that, or there's, there's sort of maybe some conflict in uh, that kind of thing. Is, is that kind of the, the thing you overcome or is, does, it, does it present itself in, in another way for you, John? I think because we, we, we take a skills approach, we're, we're, not, we're not really delving into behaviour aspects of things. Um, the skill approach is, is the ability to equip people to be able to perform a task or, or, or greater tasks. So for us, the start point is to try and get to where the pain point is. Um, and that can be difficult, particularly as you'll know, Pete, because you're a, a serial networker as I am, trying to talk to people at events about what challenges they've got is not something that other people want to reveal. Um, nobody really wants to, 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 if you like, air their dirty laundry. So it's really about trying to understand how can we, how can we help? But the thing is that pain point, if for example, let's say, let's take, so, the business objectives that we I talked about, we, we focus on business objectives of quality, efficiency and growth. And the, the pitches comes under the growth area because you're trying to grow your business. So if we focus on those three business objectives and start on quality, let's say the challenge is that the company's sales team are very transactional. Mm -hmm. So let's say that they take a phone call, 
they ask questions and they are looking to sell a product to a customer. Now that that's fine, that can work. Okay, I understand that. But where's the value to the customer? So if I'm a customer, I might have something that's a bit different. Uh, I might want to, I might want the my supplier to ask me ask me questions to get information about what I want, what I need, what my requirements are. And often in the sales process, we don't we don't do that. So we're not asking the questions. We're not asking enough quality questions of our customers to understand what their requirements are. And if you look at quality as a definition, it's the extent to which a product uh, meets requirements, so how, how well it meets requirements. Those requirements are the customer requirements. So, so I suppose the, the, the view might be, well, we've got a great, excellent sales team. Yeah, great, they, they're hitting target sales, et cetera, but you're losing customers because they're going, well, I'll, they didn't understand, they didn't ask questions. And the best example I've got of that is a company where one of their competitors met them at a, uh, a golf event and said, we, we picked up a customer off you because you hadn't told them about a product, you were worried that the price would be too high. So they came to us and were prepared to pay a higher price. So that's the onus on the sales team, being very close to their customer and getting that quality information from them, rather than going, do you want this? No, do you want that? No, thank you, put the phone down. So there's a quality problem straight away there. So what's the problem for the customer? The problem for the customer is they're gonna lose customers for, the, for our client, they'll lose customers, they'll lose sales. So I, I guess it's, it's how, it, it's that that's a pain point for any client really and but particularly on the sales side of things so i need to i need to go into asking questions of that client to find exactly where the pain point is so if they say to me i want to grow sales is it that they just want to basically sell 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 or do they want to understand their customer requirements better so they sell better products more of it and build a better relationship there's a big difference there so it's really under, it's, it's getting into the heart of where are the challenges and what I tend to find is a lot of customers will be will think it's one problem, but we sit down, we consult with the client, and once we've del delved into ask a lot of questions about what's going on, it often it's a very different problem. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah so, so, so define so defining what the actual problem is is one of the biggest problems. If I'm honest, is mm -hmm. what is the actual challenge? Um, and if you do, you know, if you're going to do training for something. Why are you doing it? What's it for? What's the end result? What's the point? How can you measure success? All these things are really important. Less so if you're doing, if you're doing very, if you like mandatory training or you're doing, you can or you can't do something because clearly that is a, can you, you know, can you drive this? Can you move that? Great. I understand. Yeah. That. yeah. But if you're trying to do something where actually you're, you're, you know, I want to increase sales. Well, what, what does that actually mean? What, how, what do you want to do exactly? So yeah, the half the problem is, what problems that have, have companies got in the first place. Yeah, I got you. So I, I understand it's it's much more performance related rather than sort of, so to speak, like technical competency where we might be looking yeah. at, I don't know, can it, it uh, does it does a driver know how to properly check his vehicle and look for defects yeah. on it? Yeah. That is yeah. a, a tangible skill set, which is, you know, we can teach through showing and, and getting people to sort of, um, you know, carry the task out, and then I yeah. focus on it, which is what traditional training is all about. But I, 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 I this is this is much more um, almost like intangible. I, I hate the term soft skills. I don't know what you use rather than soft skills. Have you got a terminology you use rather than that? Well, I think I think soft skills, as you as you as you say, a lot of people wince by it, and unfortunately, it, it's been it's been hijacked. Uh, the origin of soft skills comes from the U.S. military. Uh, and okay. it was a program the US military used for skills for soldiers that go beyond just firing a gun. So they recognized they needed soldiers to be able to write reports, to be able to do presentations. So they started what they called the soft skills program. Now, somewhere on the line, behavioral has been brought into it. That's fine. But then there's a debate about whether behavioral is actually a skill. And we could debate that till the cows come home. Some people say yeah. it's very much related to others not. I think if you look at something like critical thinking, the ability to gain value from disparate information, if you're involved in senior management of a company or if you're involved in an analysis role, I would argue that's not a soft skill because that's a key part of your job. Your job needs yeah. to be find that information. So that's where we get into difficulties. We, we, we prefer, well, the term we use is fundamental human skills um, because they are skills that ultimately, you know, thinking about things, critical thinking, to say it's finding value in information that you know that isn't immediately obvious lateral thinking is about trying to think about a problem in a different way come up with unconventional solutions it's the beginning of innovation so if you think about those skills in themselves um they become they they sort of 
that's not the same as uh, are you a good people person for example do you do you um do you build good relationships with people now that's really important but that's where we start to go well how important is that is that behavior is that skill we start to get a little difficult so we focus on the i would say we focus on the skill bit of soft skills it's why we call it fundamental human skills because those skills are essential if you think about a shop floor environment we're at a place where automation is moving manufacturing forward so more of the repetitive activities can be replaced and, and, and probably should be to improve productivity by automation if it's specified correctly, which I emphasize is really important. So then you have to ask yourself the question, what other roles are still there for humans in a manufacturing environment? Now, if that's not involving context and being able to spot what's, you know, if you think about smart motorways, is a good example, smart motorways, brilliant technology. The problem is how they're operated. So smart motors is a human problem, not a system problem for me every day of the week. Smart motorways work perfectly. If you read the coroner reports into accidents, it's down to a, a, an operational failure, not a system problem. So if, if we're gonna, if we look at the future of the workforce, the shop floor workforce, they're gonna be doing far more creativity, far more uh, thinking about where the value is, doing things that systems struggle to do, to spot things and think, well, that's not quite right. That doesn't quite work. What's this? What's that? Why do we do this? What's this about? That's about back to questioning again. So for, for me, that they are key skills. And I think going forward increasingly, that's the join between humans and technology. And I think that's what we see from a lot of our clients is how do we actually get the capacity and transform performance of those shop floor staff if we're going to involve them in the manufacturing. And a lot of evidence from automation is a redeployment of resource. It's a redeployment of resource away from less value-added activities to more value-added, which often means customer focused or more problem solving focused which is where humans will always have a bit have an edge over te over technology or at least at least for a considerable amount of time do you know what you're blowing my brains thinking about the complexity of of skills development obviously yeah. i know i i know i operate in the training and consultancy sector but to the, the the depth of the depth of the skills development we're doing mm. uh, or, or discussing here is beyond it is it is beyond uh like communication skills and leadership skills for mm. example that we talk about this is about like the human element of being mm. able to to effectively challenge consider weigh up evaluate yep. prioritization all of those yep. things which are going to be fun like you say fundamental in tomorrow's workplace in today's workplace but increasingly yep. tomorrow as automation starts to starts to sort of take over really well, I think we have a we have a position where which doesn't make sense. We have a company where there's 30 people employed in a business, and all of the decisions and all of the thinking work is done by one person, and it doesn't make any sense. Why are you employing 30 people to do that? It doesn't make sense. If you spread the load, and you encourage and you develop what you've got people wise, not only can you have a bit of freedom and work on your business, not in it, as you grow it. You're also one of the biggest complaints. People leave companies because there's no development opportunities. They don't feel like they can make a difference. There's, there's nothing really going on there. They don't feel engaged. Engagement is horrendously low in companies because people are not interested in their work. So right now, even to do with automation, it, it doesn't make sense. What, why? If we you buy a fleet of trucks, you don't sit in, in the yard and only using 20% of the time. So why are we why have we got all these people who've got fantastic skills and abilities that often remain hidden in a workforce? We don't use them. It doesn't make any sense. So the automation piece is interesting. Um, and you talk about leadership skills. What, what, and I have to ask this question, what are leadership skills? So critical thinking is a leadership skill. Now, whether you want that done by supervisors or you want it done by senior management, the point is everybody in the business can be encouraged to look at information they're getting and actually start to think about it and think, well, what does that mean? What's it trying to tell me? So, you know, straight away, you can get, uh, we can move away from an ideas box, which I'm not a great fan of on the shop floor, to actually equipping the shop floor staff with the ability to articulate really good ideas. And that takes the pressure off the supervisor level, which then takes the pressure off the management level and so everyone can move forward. So we're getting much more value out of a company. And, and as a resource, as a machine or a system, we'd always do that. Why, why, why do we not do it with people? It doesn't make sense. Um, and, and we also think that degrees and apprenticeships cover everything. Well, yeah, they, they, they're massively important and, and degrees are absolutely crucial to that. I have one myself and, and really important part of it as our apprenticeships. But we also got to be thinking about what problem are we trying to solve? 
What's the problem we're trying to solve? So how confident, for example, for your business, how confident with your sales team are you that the quality of your questioning is good enough with your customers so that you are gaining every opportunity you can about what they're doing and about what they want? Hi, it's Pete from Flagship Partners. We're proud to sponsor a Half Dozen Things podcast. Flagship Partners help their clients become safer, greener, and greater through a range of consultancy and training services. We offer audits through to risk assessments, contracts through to support with managing your culture, all the way from mandatory training through to management training as well. So if you need any support, please do get in touch with Flagship Partners today. It's a good question. It's a fantastic question. And and it, my answer for my business is that I don't, I haven't closely monitored that enough as, as, as what, what I believe I could do. And I think you, I think one of the things is, is particularly when you're an entrepreneur is you, you, you often are challenging and problem solving and have those skills and mindset. And you, there's, there's an assumption that other people have the same, same yeah. skill set and actually, and yeah. actually they don't at all. Um, and, and particularly people who have those skills will, will assume others do the same and then feel let down when they don't. So when if just looking at the different the three different things that you said around problem solving, critical thinking and lateral thinking, just yep. to sort of re-articulate those. How do so critical thinking in a mm. nutshell, what is it and and how do you how do we sort of develop that in somebody? Well, I think one of the biggest problems to start with is that it's one of those skills that everyone that's talked about at a high level. And um, it's the, 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 the challenge is if you, you I, I do love Cambridge here because it has such variances. Um, so if you go to Cambridge, it's talked about as if it's second knowledge. Okay, oh, critical thinking. The problem is we're not applying what, what does critical thinking mean to a business? It's a term, people go, oh, it's important, but it becomes a nice to have. So let, let's just I'll, just, park, I'll just park it for a second to explain that. So if I say to somebody in a business, do you want good critical thinking skills? They'll go, no, not really. Oh, it might be nice, great. If I say to them, would you like better success from your tenders because you're going to get far more responses and there'll be better quality and you'll get more business? They'll go, oh, yeah, definitely. And I said, well, that, that'd be, that's critical thinking then. So we have to apply it to something. This is the, this is the thing. There's no good having skills that are not applied to something. So critical thinking really is, is anything to do with being able to assess things, being able to analyze things, being able to look beyond the obvious, being able to look at root cause analysis. It's anything really where you're trying to trying to check things, trying to evaluate things. It, it's it's really where you, you're, you're if, if anything, you're being a skeptic. Now, skepticism is a badly used phrase because we tend to think it's very negative. Skepticism is, is healthy questioning. So you're questioning all the time, why is this, what's this? Not in an irritating, annoying way, because that's, 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 that's pointless. You're just trying to dig into the information. It, I would assume that, right? What's that assumption based on? Does anyone check that? Uh, why do we do that? What, what's the purpose of that? You know, it, it's all these things, because business and organisations, as they go on, it's, you've, you've said yourself, you will assume, you might leave the business on a Friday night, you assume, oh, it'll be fine. If something happens, someone will figure that out. Well, they don't, because they're not, they're not you, but... It's not trying to catch them out. It's trying to introduce them to, to a broader range of skills and abilities and capacities that you can do. Because actually what you're trying to do, you're trying to make it better for them. So I think what we've got to be careful of is we're not trying to catch people out. We're trying to say, look, you, you're great at what you do, but you can do it better. There's, there's, there's better performance. Motorsport, they don't just go, well, we went around the track quite fast. That'll do. That's not how they operate. They, they want to get to the heart of what they want. If they can get three, you know, three seconds here, they'll take it every day of the week. So, so critical, sorry, back to critical thinking then. So yeah, so it's that, it's that ability to look at something and not, not make, not make easy assumptions, not uh, have a bias, you know, what, what, what does that take? So let, let's say if you look at, um, let's say if you look at uh, opportunities in, let's say the Peterborough area, you've got to get out and about and see things. You've got to go out and see, if you want to look at what factories are, you need to go out and see what's on the industrial estates, who's making what, what's their supply chain look like, where do they get their components from? You're actually qualifying that information. So when you do a, if you want to do a round robin activity for Peterborough, you go, well, there we go. I've got all this information. Now, you might think, oh, there's no manufacturing in Peterborough. It's often been said um, because people don't check it. And that's a, that's a narrative we've got. We don't check that information. What's that based on? 
says who what, what do you so you, you're actually getting good what you want is good quality information to make the right decisions based on and that's the heart of critical thinking the lateral thinking side of things is if you think about it, there's value that sits there the value that sits there if you think about any innovation somebody's come across something often by accident because they've had to thought think about something differently so let's take d-day as a good example d-day great way of getting kit off the ships onto the beach somebody sat back and think why don't we do that at dover and that's what that's where your car ferry industry comes from so it, it's finding the value but we can't see that value if we're only going to look at something the way we always look at it we're going to take people out of their comfort zone look at it differently and you can see the value that wasn't there so what you're doing is you're starting the process of curiosity you start the process of play experimentation to try and find that value you can't find at the minute and that at the moment is the key for me it underpins the innovation process of trying to make things better so it's not something it's not something again lateral thinking sounds a bit airy fairy but actually what you're trying to do is find value that's not currently there well every business should be trying to find value that's not currently there shouldn't they in theory um and then on to the problem solving is, is this idea that actually we need to have action measurable actions that we can do that we can put in place uh, that we've actually taken a bit of time to think about what we're trying to do too often what we do is we run straight into the doing we go straight into the doing without thinking about well hang on have i, have I approached this the right way and the doing takes a lot longer because we haven't done the prep work previously so if you do the lateral thinking the critical thinking first your solutions are downside better than it would have been if you just come in to try and solve problems um, and i think that's that's the piece so those three all sit together because if you do critical thinking, uh, you get a lot of good quality information, but then you can't innovate with it. If you do lateral thinking on its own, everybody has great ideas, but you then don't take those ideas forward into any value. You know, if we, we let's, let's say we had a, a, a team day and we all went out and did some wacky things, you might think, brilliant. What I really want is the value from that. I don't want people to go, oh, it was a great day. Yeah, fantastic. But where's the value in, in we've created an environment where people have thought differently for the day, I now want the value from it. It's lost in the car park if we can't capture it and take it forward to, to solutions effectively. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, I th it's sort of a fascinating way. I've not I've not really thought about skills in in that context previously, mm. and I find that I find that really really interesting. So, how how do you and Sarah? How, like, what's the what's the how? I suppose. So we've sort of focused on what the uh, what the challenges are, so to speak, but how do you how do you get people to improve and access those skills? How how do you how do you sort of work on developing those? Well, first of all, you, you've got to break it down into um, I, I guess sort of five actions. The we practice consistently question, questioning, analyzing, innovating, solving, and reviewing. So we constantly practice that. So we go through, we introduce as a concept. How do we do questions? What how, what are questions? What's the value of questions? What happens if we don't do them? Why don't we do them? So we talk about that in the sense of, of how that works, but it's it's related back to business objectives. So when I mentioned to you about uh, quality planning, the idea of customers getting, or you're getting better value information from customers. If that's a business objective, everybody in the workshop is aware of the fact that's what we're trying to achieve. So when we talk about questioning, we're actually talking about getting information from customers, essentially. So that's, that's the piece to go over it. What's interesting is when you ask people, are they good at questioning? They'll normally say, yes, I'm very good at questioning. Mm. Uh, and, that, and that's it. So traditionally what happens is that's the point at which if you, if you take like an entrepreneurial course, let's say, we do a, we do a, a slideshow and we go, right, are you good at uh, thinking on your feet? Yes, tick. Great. Are you, have you got the gift of the gap? Yes, I have tick. There you go, sir. There's a certificate. You've done the entrepreneurial course. Now, that's no good. Because all we've done is we've gone over it. I've gone through how questioning works. You've gone, oh, yes, that's great. What we need is we've got to have, we have to have practice. We've got to have practice. If you can't practice something, you're never going to pick it up. A bit like riding a bike. Nobody goes to a PowerPoint presentation about riding a bike. Nobody does that. You learn how to do it. Correct. Learn by doing. So and you all know this from the past. We've spoke about it. We introduce a creative project in the training in the sense that that is the vehicle to practice the skills if you give someone a task they've never done before unless they can ask questions they can't do the task so if you give something somebody they've never done before 
if they if they can't get the information to do the task, they won't be able to do it. So what better way of practicing questioning by getting people to have to do questioning? So the idea of the creative piece is it also allows the lateral thinking because you're thinking differently about things. So the creative project could be anything. It doesn't matter what it is. It's irrelevant. The point is you're giving someone a task to do that they don't normally do. It's not part of their day job. It's not part of that at all. But they've got to follow questioning, analyzing, innovating, solving, reviewing. You're giving them instructions. You are tutoring them to do it, but they've got to follow the instructions. They've got to follow the information. And that helps them practice and is a very memorable way of doing it because we need to take people out of their comfort zone. If we just did the workshop and we talked about questioning and analyzing and everyone went, oh, I'm very good at that. I'm yes, I, I think I'm a seven out of 10 for analyzing. We don't practice it. We've got no way of proving that, but no way of knowing. If you're giving people a lot of information and, they, and by them asking questions, they then have to analyze that information to make decisions about what they're going to do. And it, the decisions they make are right in front of them because they've got to do a, a creative project. Then ultimately that is analysis and practice. And we've found that's the most effective way of getting the skills into practice. That's what, and that's how we do it. Fascinating. That's absolutely fantastic. It's um, it's interesting. You you speaking has reminded me of um, when I did my NLP master practitioner training mm. before. I'd never been. I'd never been clay pigeon shooting, which mm. I know is really really random, but I'd never been before. And one of the the reason we did it is one of the women on the course. We we're focusing on this thing called modeling, which is a system mm. within NLP where you ask loads and loads of questions of somebody who's an expert at something, yep. and essentially you are then able to model their expertise because you've asked loads and loads of questions. So, um, and there's a particular style of doing it which which. Mm imitate similarly to your critical and lateral uh the, the critical and lateral thinking that we've been discussing yep. and um the the modeling process is something which um people like tony robbins for example is, a, is an absolute expert at because what he does to go and write his books is he'll go and spend time with experts in their field he'll ask them loads of questions to be able to then go and model what they do to be able to write his book now uh one of the activities we did was clay pigeon shooting where um the lady who is a absolutely absolute expert at clay pigeon shooting. We spent some time with her in a classroom where um, we we started to basically map the process that she follows to do clay pigeon shooting around down to what she smells, what she sees, mm. what she hears, what she looks out for. So when she hears certain things, what's the mm. trigger point? Where she sits the gun? All of those kinds of things. So in, in a real deep, in depth level of questions and answers, things that you know, if you in a standard workplace conversation where you maybe had an apprentice and a master who who was very skilled in a much deeper, at a much deeper level, um, yeah. similar to the one you're discussing. And interestingly, uh, there was five of us in the group and everyone went and did the clay pigeon shooting and they were all absolutely fantastic at it mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they'd, mo they'd modeled yeah. by asking really in-depth questions. They'd written a really good quality procedure um, mm. and essentially carried out this modeling technique that we'd learn, mm. they were able to then go and do a very, a very competent, so it yeah. improved the performance mm. essentially by, by sort of following that modeling process, which sounds a sort of a, a similar, uh, yeah. a similar sort of uh, process that you're talking about, but you you do it in a, you do it in a different way using yeah. creative yeah, so we, projects. Yeah. So we do, we currently do uh, producing oil painting um, from scratch, which, is again as you'll see behind me that's one of sarah's piece of work when she did her own collection so she's very which good is beautiful by the way it's actually beautiful it's pop, popping on the screen <laughs> yeah indeed indeed um or we do writing a story writing a uh, a short short section of the story again now the, the key thing is it's not about and this is what we try and explain it's not about being claude monet it's not about being charles dickens it doesn't matter it could be anything the key of it is once you've done that activity you need to be able to apply the skills that you've learned from doing the activity back to the job role, back to the business task. If all we do is the creative activity, everyone goes, wasn't that wonderful? And all the value's lost. So you've got to take it back to, right, okay. So we did a lot of questioning today, fantastic. Now I want back to the example of the quality. We want to be able to demonstrate that in a sales role, in your role, can you ask better quality questions when you go back to your job role? How are we going to introduce that to your role? So you're rather than yes, yes, no, yes, no. How are you going to get into? Oh, that's interesting. So tell me a bit about that. Oh, how, how does that? Oh, you, oh, I see. I see you. Oh, you're at a trade show. That's interesting. What 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 you do? It's it's getting more information. So the value of the training is back into the business. 
We also do embedding where we do one-to-ones after the event, which is again, is a revisit of the training, right? How, what questions have you asked? How are you finding it? What barriers have you got against it? How is it, make, how is it moving it forward? Now, our deliverable is we will deliver better questioning in the business related to the business objective. You'd be a fool to say we're going to increase sales by 12, 15%. That just is totally unrealistic. The point is the value was we wanted better quality questions asked in, in the business. What will happen is the customer is going to be far more likely to give that information. You're going to be far more likely to be on top of a tender before it even happens and know what's going on for, they might say, well, we're buying another factory in Norfolk. Actually, that's coming up as opposed to a very flat approach when you're just not asking those questions. There's a trust relationship built. So there's a direct correlation between what the challenge was, the, the, the background to the skills, the practice of the skills for the creative project, the application and the embedding. And I say the application, the embedding is absolutely vital. Uh, because otherwise you, you don't you lose the value so certainly there is there are a lot of similarities i think one of the, one of the good things about creativity it's universal in the sense that something some sometimes something's physical and it can put certain people off i mean you see that from team building days sometimes people just don't want to do that in fact the stats about people a lot of people something like a third of people are horrified by the idea of team building days because they actually detest them so if we can do something where we're inclusive of everybody and there's no barriers across the business. It can be the MD, it can be the person on reception, it doesn't make any difference. The point is they're all pulling together and they've got no hidden advantage. There's no hidden advantage, that's helpful. Nobody can come and go, oh, I know what I'm doing, I've aced this because it's, for example, some companies do training where they take it offline and it's simply a simulation of what's going on in the day job. Well, that, that suits certain people because certain people do that. So they're gonna go, oh, this is easy. So we take about their comfort zone, but it's a safe place. And I think that's the key thing. How do we how do we find a safe place to take people out of their comfort zone? And we can find those talents and that skill that we didn't know was there. And companies often don't know it's there. So rather than blow your brains out trying to recruit supervisors, maybe you've got someone who runs a basketball team you didn't know, and they've got the skills to do it. And we can demonstrate it through the workshop. You've just saved yourself a fortune on recruiting somebody. So that that kind of works. So it's all about capabilities. But there, there are sounds like some there are some similarities certainly on the way that that's approached. But it is, you're right, it's about drilling down to getting those questions and getting that information. Some, one thing we find with questioning is that often it's the actual process of questioning. People try and answer questions. No, no, just do the questioning. Don't try and answer it. Just ask the question. You can do the answering later. If you ask the question, you'll find it starts to really broaden out and you've got a massive area. And that's where you find ideas, things you didn't see before. And that's where, the, that's where you really start to get some real quality information and clarifying what you're trying to do. So yes, there are certainly some similarities there, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. It's re- it's actually really interesting um, the, the point you just made there to pick up on that around the 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 latent potential in existing mm. team members that often exist because of the yeah. type of role they do. Yeah. And um, I, I just wanted to sort of touch on that before I go to my next question, which I find, I always, I always find a really, really important part of any element of consultancy that uh, we do with the businesses mm. is to sort of find, find that latent skill set. Um, it's interesting when I, I interviewed for the podcast, uh, a guy called Neville Wright, who built mm. Kiddie Care and then sold it for a ridiculous amount oh, okay. of money. Um, Kiddie Care were based in Peterborough. They did Morrison's. cramps, push chairs and all that sort of thing. Yeah. And Morrison's bought them. And he had this ethos, which really, really sort of mirrors what you're saying there, which is um, it, I can't remember the name of the lady. I think she was called Karen. He said a job for Karen. And basically his his premise was, was mm. that every every person has got, a, a, a strong skill set and actually mm. the the focus should be on finding the right role for the person mm. so they have this skill set and often people just ignore uh, yeah. the ability they've already got in their team and obviously that that work you're doing with mm. those those teams is, is, is yeah. enabling that to sort of come forward which i think mm. is really interesting too um you mentioned earlier you mentioned earlier about culture which is a big thing certainly mm. for for me with flagship and and sort of my ears pricked up when we talk about safety culture and compliance and those kinds of things and how we affect culture. So just a bit of a touch on that, because I, my belief is that culture and performance are quite like are quite closely linked. Mm. Um, are you able to just articulate sort of what culture means for you, John, and then also around how you see an evolution, certainly maybe an example of a, a client you've worked with and how their culture has evolved through the back of the process you've been through with them? Well, I think um, I think both of us have a, a both Sarah and I as, as as founders, we both have a view that actually 
you can easily get put in boxes. Um, and I think pretty much if, you, if you've got passion, passion and practice with something means most people can achieve most things. I think we genuinely believe that. And it's easy, it's easy to write people off and go, oh, they can't do this, they don't do that. And I think the culture of the business has always been based on that principle that actually, um, I, I, at school, uh, for example, I was, um, my English teacher said, oh, he, he's terrible, he doesn't want to read the books. And, you know, they thought I would remedial your reading age. The problem was I didn't, I wasn't interested in the books. They did not interest me. So I wouldn't read them. But the, the assumption was he doesn't want to read, he's no good at reading. So I've had that all my life where people have said, well, you know, that's this, that, and the other. They make these assumptions. And I, I don't, the, the reality is from our work that we do, we don't find that. We find that we we can find a fitter who ends up being their engineering project manager. But they just haven't, the companies have not looked at and given the time to do that. So give people, give people um, the confidence uh, and some of the skills to do things and they can achieve a lot. And I think that's the heart of what we believe as a business. And so therefore we're always, our, our passion is watching companies succeed. Um, we, we, we like watching people come alive when they, when they realize they, they can, they do something they can't do. For example, you, you, if you came on the workshop by the end of the day, you'd be able to produce that or equivalent to, I kid you not, because you can, the point is people who come to these workshops never done anything by the end of the day, they've done something they've never done before. And they're, they're buzzing, absolutely buzzing. And that's part of what we, why we do what we do. So I think ours is always about progression um, within the culture, progression and learning and development and trying to move things forward and, and trying to remove certain labels and stereotypes that frankly don't stand up, don't stand up to scrutiny when you look at it. So I guess that's, that's part of the culture of, of where we are. But we also, we also practice what we preach. We, we do our own training on all our own internal processes. So if I have an internal process to do, we use our own training to do it. So it's not something we, you know, we're not, I'm not like the hairdresser with a terrible haircut, if you follow me. Um, it, it's kind of like we, we agree, we agree those things. And that's, that's, that's probably central to, uh, to how we operate, I guess. And I think that's, that's what our customers tell us um, because they're very precious about their business, their people. And it's very, it can be very personal for them to allow us into a business. So we've got to approach it with a bit of, uh, you know, a bit of um, sort of care and interest and, and trying to, trying to cap some of the passion they have for their business. And we like we like it when we, we get that we get that um, exposure to understand understand their business and their challenges a bit in a bit more detail. Hope that answers your questions. A bit random, but no, yeah. no, 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 at all, John. Um, it's been absolutely it's absolutely fascinating, John. Is there a question? So we're in the spirit of critical and lateral thinking. Mm. Is there so sometimes the the question the best question is the one that hasn't been asked because I've not got the question. Uh, skills so the question mm. I'm going to ask you is mm. what's the question that I've not asked that would be really useful for listeners to give the answer to if there's something that I've not quite that I've maybe not covered yet I think probably what what difference does this does this approach make to a business in terms of day-to-day -day? What, what what actual okay. difference does it make I'll guess. perfect okay John so what Wonderful. difference does what difference does this approach make to mm. a business well, I think it again. I think it's about trying to align back to what you want to what you want to achieve. I think sometimes we rush into training, and, and people say we we've always done like this. This is the training we want to do. My question is, what what problem are you trying to solve? Again, if we can link problems you want to solve in a business, and we can solve it by training to actually solve that problem, as opposed to just do training for training's sake, then I think you're going to have a far better payback and far more alignment between the value of training. To actually affect culture and, and, and change in the business. Too often at the minute, it's oh, we need sales training, we need leadership training. Great, but actually, let's have a look at what are the problems. So, if the training is solved and allocated to a problem, then you can see the real benefit in the business. And that's the thing because you you, you know back to the sales team, the sales team are now asking better questions. So you're getting better quality information from your customers. That's the benefit. And I think we have to be looking at where is the actual benefit of the training. Where does it actually sit? And how can we say, yeah, we did that, and that was the, that was the benefit. And we thought long and hard about how do we get across that with the product to the customer that if they invest and they decide to commit to this, they can actually see an, a, a tangible benefit. Certainly, fantastic. So uh, my understanding of that would be that you've got quite a, a robust discovery process with your yep. with your customers when they Absolutely. come to you. There's this robust discovery process where yep. you 
essentially find very similar to like an accident investigation, so to speak, where yeah. sometimes we think the challenge is this. Sorry, my hands off screen. Uh, the challenge yeah. is this, but actually it's this over here. And that, yeah, that's yeah, the, yeah. It's, it's the uncovering the, the, the root cause of the well, challenge. You, you, the discovery you, process is vital. You raise a good point. Emergency services are very good at that because they arrive at the scene and they have to ask questions. They don't make assumptions. They go in and say, what's this happened? Where was this car? Where's this driver? Where's that person? You know, they, they need facts, they need quality information. They make assumptions, frankly, people end up dying or they miss evidence. Mm. Uh, and that, that is a good example of where that's used in a very good sense um, and very productive. But yeah, certainly, I agree. Brilliant, John. If, um, if, if people have been sort of, if this has sort of whetted someone's appetite for a, for a more developmental conversation, mm. where, like, what, what do you recommend? Where, where, where should they go? What should they do? I think, first of all, is have a bit of a think about ultimately what it is you're trying to achieve. Um, we, we can we can we can certainly delve into that and go into the piece, but we don't we don't tend to work with clients where after sitting down and having some consultation and having a bit of discovery, we can't get to something that's actually measurable because ultimately they'll never be satisfied. And I get that because it won't actually solve the problem. So I think it's about thinking about what your priorities are now, where are the barriers, where do you want to be. Um, and ultimately, what what is what's if you like what's affecting that? Have a good think about what's really affecting that. So, you know, back to sales. Do you want more sales? Is it is it about more sales, or is it actually about you really want to understand your customers better? Which is it? So you need to ask yourself some fairly good probing questions. Beyond that, we offer a, a free one hour uh, online consultancy where we will go into that as you've just alluded to and ask those questions again. Back to question you we'll go into that to try and get to uh, a point, it's a very simple process. And ultimately from that, that gives you an understanding of what that is. Now, it's not obligatory, so you could go away and go, well, I don't want to do that really, um, but it might give you an idea. So if anyone wants to do that, um, then certainly they can they can contact me. The website's at all the Ws, Sarah Penrose, Sarah Penrose S-A-R-A-P-E-N-R-O-S-E.co.uk. Uh, and then you can send us a message through there. That'd be great, it'd be great to talk to you and we're happy to do that, so that's good. Fantastic. Um, John, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the podcast Perfect. and uh, it's been absolutely, absolutely fascinating, mate. So um, thank you very much for coming on. Thanks for having and, me. Uh, I, yeah, and I hope, the, I hope the listeners have got some value from that. Uh, reach out to John, reach out to Sarah. Uh, you've had the, the website there. I'll put the website on the show notes and uh, and hopefully people will be able to get in touch. Anyway, That's thank you very excellent. much, John. Thanks, Pete. Take care. Thanks thank everybody. you very much. Cheers. Take care. Thanks. Cheers. Bye-bye. 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 I really hope you loved today's episode. And if you did, please make sure you subscribe and listen out for future episodes too. Please do share it across your social media channels. We hope to reach more and help more people. If you want to find out more about me, my name's Pete Rushmer. You'll find me across any social media channel and my business, Flagship Partners, and we're your partners in success across your business. Thank you. See you again soon.